What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this episode of The Breakdown. I am your host, Danny Morang. And on today's episode, we're going to take a look at 2021 free agency wings. Now, we're not looking at the big name players. We're looking at back end rotation guys that you're not afraid to put out there. They're going to give you some value in certain areas defensive versatility, length, athleticism, maybe some three point shooting, maybe a little bit of creation. You're not going to be able to tick all the boxes. What you are going to do is be able to fill out your roster a little bit better and have some more guys out there that you trust in crunch time. Let's get into it. Coming in at number one, we're just going to get it out of the way right off the bat. Nick Batum. Uh, obviously, he's uh, a source of a lot of discussion after his years in Portland. Uh, went on to Charlotte. Didn't really live up to expectations uh, really based on his contract, but still a hell of a player. He's a guy who can do a little bit of everything. Uh, he came in and he was likened to Scotty Pippen, and that was probably a stretch too far. Um, but what he can do is tick a lot of the boxes. If he's your 6th, 7th, 8th best player, you've probably got yourself a hell of a roster. Uh, and that's what really stood out really with the Clippers this last year. A couple things changed. One, he became less of a facilitator, more of a play-ender. He was more about shooting the basketball. Uh, kind, not a full stretch big, but a, a stretch big wing. Something that's become more and more valuable in the NBA, a 6'7 to 6'10 guy who can put the ball on the floor, can shoot it, create for themselves a little bit, or create for others. He's right smack in the middle of that. Middle of that. And him and the guys like the Morris Twins are kind of leading that charge, and they're incredibly valuable players. Uh, while Nick's shooting rate went up, and he had his highest true shooting percentage of his career, his playmaking did go down. Uh, it Cut really almost down to a third of what it was at its peak. A 28% assist percentage uh, at its peak was at, uh, just under 11% this year. But you you aren't worried about him in certain positions. If he has the ball above the break with six seconds to go on the shot clock, you know that he's probably going to make the right decision. In the past, that may not have been true. But here's the flip side. You can get him likely for the BAE or less. And there's just so few players you can get who can shoot the ball, who can put the ball on the floor, who can defend multiple positions, who can create for themselves and for others at that price. Has he lost a step? Yes. Is he uh, any longer the best point of attack defender? No. He's much, much better as a helper. But if Robert Covington picks up a nick or you want to go uh, with a small ball lineup where you've got Cov at the five, you can slide Nick in at the four. You can play him at the three. He's a very, very good helper defender. And if you have Covington off the floor and you want to replicate some of his ability as a spot-up three-point shooter and a help defender, it's tough not to have a guy like a Nick Batum. So if you can get him, if you can get him at that BAE or less, that's just the basketball stuff. If you flip it just a little bit further... Damian Lillard, over the last, I don't know, five, six years now, has at multiple times called Nicholas Batum one of his favorite teammates. If you're trying to keep a Damian Lillard happy, let's take a look at Aaron Rodgers right now getting Randall Cobb sent back because that's one of his guys. If Nick is one of Dame's guys and you can get him for a BAE or less, probably something you should take a look at because, well, you're trying to keep Damian Lillard happy. So there you go. Nick Batum, right out of the gate. You know who he is. You know what he can do. He fits right in. He knows the team. He knows the culture. And most importantly, he's a friend of Damian Lillard. So if you can make that one happen, it's a great place to start. Coming in at number two, it's another familiar name, Otto Porter Jr. Much like Nick Batum, he ticks more boxes than you would probably associate with somebody being available at that TPMLE or less. Now, if you listen to or follow John Hollinger, uh, he has his new metric, the boards. Uh, basically, it's a formula that's put together that estimates what dollar value uh, a certain player has attached to them. Right now, Otto Porter Jr., I believe, is at $7.7 million, So that's a little bit over that TPMLE. Now, whether or not you believe he's going to be pushed up into the MLE bracket because there's still potential there in his health or getting him out there on the floor being in the right situation, I wouldn't exactly call the Wizards, Bulls, and Magic the uh, most <laughs> endearing places for basketball growth. Or the flip side is, he's played 42 games in the last two years and teams want him to prove it. I think the scarcity of, of these kind of guys keeps him around that level, but maybe he takes a little bit less to go to a situation that makes a little bit more sense. On the basketball side of things, he has been linked to the Blazers for years. There's no doubt about that. They, they have had interest in him, whether, again, it's with the Bulls, the Wizards, or the Magic or in a buyout market. And the reason is he's a 40% career three-point shooter. He's also an incredible mid-range shooter. The one thing that he doesn't do, really, is get to the rim. He's 
actually pretty subpar in that regard. But he's very good at getting to and creating his shot in the mid-range. He feasts there. Uh, he's incredibly underrated in that aspect. And if you're talking about acquiring a guy that is going to be a part of your you know initial rotation that can do a little bit more uh, in shot creation than your you know average six seven eight guy I that's that's a boon Let, let's be honest um, but again this doesn't come without risks he, he has been injury prone with things that are scary when you're talking about anybody in the professional athlete ranks feet and backs uh, you'd have to have a good look at those medicals and truly believe that he's past those things or you're willing and okay to accept that he's going to miss 25 games if you're good with that, then there's there's a real chance. He could be a very, very good player for this team. He would address a lot of needs, uh, a, a multifaceted player, not really that high on the, the creation side of things outside of creating his own shot, but the fact that he could create his own shot, you could solve a little bit of the Carmelo Anthony uh, conundrum in that Melo did fit a need. They needed shot creation. It's just that he didn't give anything else outside of catch-and-shoot three-point shooting. Porter Jr. gives you a little bit more versatility. He's not uh, the bucket that Carmelo Anthony can and, and, and could be at times, but he's also a much better athlete and a better defender. Now, don't get it twisted. He's not a stopper. He's got good size. He's got good length. He's got a good defensive IQ, but he's never been a guy who's incredibly fleet of foot. Um, he's not slow by any, any means. I would compare him a lot to Covington in that regard where – the quicker guys are going to beat him, but he's got, again, the size and length to be able to be competitive in that regard and be a good help side defender. Um, and if, again, we're talking about with him and Nick Batum, if those guys are your six, seven, eighth best players, you've got yourself a pretty darn good team uh, as long as you can finish up uh, you know, at the top of the roster. If Portland could get their hands on him for that TPMLE, that would legitimately be no Neil O'Shea bashing aside, anything like that. That would be an incredibly good move. It would be something... At least on the surface, you could say, hey, that's a solid move. Whether or not they could get that to happen and whether or not he could stay healthy, those things matter. But on the uh, winning the press conference side of things, pretty solid move. At number three, we're going to go with Torrey Craig. Torrey Craig is a guy that can help just about any team in the NBA. He's very much in the same vein as P.J. Tucker. He doesn't have a, a ton of value where he does this, that, and the other. It's just that he does the things that he does really well. He can hit catch and shoot threes at a decent enough clip. He's athletic and mobile enough to be switchable. He works hard. He grinds possessions into dust. He has real size. Those are the things that help on championship caliber teams. The difference between the Phoenix Suns or even the Milwaukee Bucks going from one of their starter caliber guys to their bench is that the drop-off isn't tremendous. There's drop-off. There's no doubt about it. But the difference is it's not Robert Covington to Carmelo Anthony. It's Jay Crowder to Torrey Craig. And that's not to throw Melo under the bus. It's just he's an awful defender at this point in his career. So there's certain things you can do to take advantage of those lineups. Torrey Craig, like we said, does just enough to stay on the floor. He can knock down 36, 37% of his threes. That's the same kind of thing as Covington. In reality, he's baby Bob. He's a six foot seven defender with an unknown standing reach, but by all accounts, he's very, very long. He's got good timing, uh, a good defensive IQ. He can gobble up shots at the rim. He's got an incredibly high rim deterrence rate and a block rate, particularly for his size, which, again, if you're keeping track, sounds a lot like Bob Covington. So if you're the Portland Trailblazers and you can get a guy who's 75 80% of Covington defensively to come off your bench and replicate the same kind of things offensively, you get a little fall off with shot creation. It's not much there to begin with but you get everything else, then you're doing good. Again, that's the theme of all of these guys. The, when you put them on the floor, you're not afraid. that you're, you, can, you can win minutes as opposed to just hold surf. And those are the kind of things that the Portland Trailblazers need to do beyond everything else. This is another checkbox. They need to win those minutes easier and better and more frequently so they're not relying on the likes of Damian Lillard to bail them in, bail them out <laughs> night in, night out. At number four, we're getting into the one guy in this list who's more of a 2-3 as opposed to a 3-4 type. Uh, and that's Tony Snell. Tony Snell has had this weird career where he's had some decent highs and some pretty low lows. 
he became a bit of a meme this year in the sense of that he shot the ever living hell out of the ball on a small sample size. Shot 57% from three this year. And people can, ah, oh, you know, the volume isn't there. He's not Joe Harris. That's, that's fine. But the flip side of this is the previous four years, he shot 40% or better from three. He's a career 40% three point shooter on volume. So you may have questions about his game otherwise, but one thing is clear. He can shoot the ball. He's very much in the the same realm of shooters as, uh, I don't know, Gary Trent Jr., of Joe Harris, <laughs> of any of the, the premier guys that we've seen that have kind of had this weird rise based on their shooting. And, you know, you have one strong stint, uh, Joe Harris, before his contract, uh, before struggling weirdly this year uh, in the playoffs, or Gary Trent Jr. in the bubble. In this sense, you had Tony Snell, who this year, a little over 100 attempts, but again, shot it incredibly well. Now, he's limited in other areas. There's no doubt about that. He doesn't really give you any additional creation for himself or for others. He doesn't really take twos at all. He is kind of a three or nothing. If you ramp the uh, shot volume up, you gave him some Duncan Robinson-esque levels, it'd be interesting to see what happens. He doesn't run off the ball nearly as much. He's a stationary catch-and-shoot guy. That's what he does incredibly well. Why would the Portland Trailblazers take a look at him? Well, he's a passable defender. Um, Maybe more than passable. He's got good size. At 6'6", he's maybe a little bit undersized for the three, but (laughs) that's still bigger than most threes that Portland throws out there. The other part of this is he's got an 8'10 standing reach. He's pretty darn long for a guy his size. There's no doubt about that. Moves his feet well. He's a good athlete. Uh, he's not heavy footed by any means. I wouldn't say he has the highest defensive IQ, but he's, he's not a guy. Again, this is the theme. You're not terrified of throwing them out there. Is he your sixth, seventh or eighth guy, or is he better as your seven, eight, nine? I tend to lean towards the latter because his skill sets are a little bit more compressed, but he also spikes in those skill sets where it's not a bad thing to have a guy you can put on the floor who you can rely on to knock down threes. Um, the Portland Trailblazers have made no bones about it in the Terry Stotts area of leaning forward into threes. The Clippers were a team that leaned forward into threes. I would expect Chauncey Billups to come into Portland and lean on some guys that can knock down some threes. Having more guys on your bench that can shoot is a good thing. So if the Portland Trailblazers are looking for a guy that they can find on the cheap, and let's be honest, you're probably going to get him for a vet minimum, you could do worse than Tony Snell. You can put him out there. He can be a two-way guy, and again, you're not afraid to play him. That's a win. Rounding out the list at number five, I'm going to go wild card here. I'm going to go Michael Beasley. Now, hear me out before everybody's going to say, go, oh, I'm sorry, what? Number one, he's already got the Summer League invite. He's going to be a part of the organization. And normally, I wouldn't give it any credence at all, but back end of the rotation, maybe not even a rotation, just taking a flyer on a guy this much, it, it screams Neil Olshay. Why? Well, in 2018, the Portland Trailblazers were linked to him. Again, if you've paid attention over the years, Neil Olshay always gets his guy. It's going to be interesting. Let's see what he looks like in Summer League. If he's going to be a guy the Portland Trailblazers add as 10, 11, 12, 13. I don't know if you can put him out there and trust him. Again, the, the, the continuing theme of all of this is that you want guys out there you can trust. Is this the next version of Carmelo Anthony? If you're trying to find a redemption tour on a guy who offensively is pretty talented, or at least was pretty talented. There's certainly some other things, whether or not he's unlocking the 11th or 12th percentage of his brain. But if you're talking about the back end of the bench, why not? Get weird. That's, I mean, that's, that's the Portland motto, right? It's just, it's hard for me to see Neil O'Shea going away from something like this because seemingly every year there's always one of these guys. Just I don't know if it's necessarily pulling a rabbit out of a hat, but it's pulling something out of a hat. <laughs> so you've got really three guys I think that could help you a ton uh, up and down this list. Two for sure. The third I could be talked into. So you've got Nick Batum, you've got Alpore Jr. Those two for sure. The third guy, I think Torrey Craig is, is a good, solid backup. Then you start to go, well, Tony Snell could help this team. And it... I can, I can go with it. It's not going to really elevate you. It's not going to hurt you by any means. That's for sure. Michael Beasley is a surefire wild card. You don't know what you're going to get. Or is it a useful uh, place for a guy like Beasley to land, or is it a waste of a roster spot? I don't know. But, I mean, 
Is there worse things right now than having something weird and funky than, I don't know, talking about Damian Lillard's future in Portland? If nothing else, it'll make for a compelling storyline for at least some period of time. There's plenty of other guys out there in the vet men that we've discussed and talked about in the comments and up and down Blazer's Edge. This one to me was just like, I wonder. Let me go ahead and stick this one in there and see what people think. So take a, take a minute. Let me know. Leave your thoughts in the comments as always. Thank you so, so much. If you haven't already, like, rate, review, subscribe, whether you listen to the podcast, whether you're here on YouTube, I appreciate you all so, so, so very much. Until next time, take care. Bye.